Okay, now I've got a magnet here, ceramic magnet, pretty strong magnet. I'm going to set it in its side, and we can pretty much imagine that what we have is we have magnetic field lines. Let's say flowing into this magnet. So we have a magnetic field that might look something like this in the vicinity of the magnet. And as we get around the edges, the magnetic field gets weaker. Maybe gets stronger. Actually, at this point, it'll probably just about cancel out. But we won't worry about the details of the magnetic field. And similarly, up along here, and I'm not going to try to, well, I might as well try to label it here. Not label it, but represent it. Okay. Now, of course, that field comes out into three dimensions and kind of points toward the magnet. As we move to a greater and greater angle, the field is going to get less at a given distance. So we can kind of imagine this magnet being surrounded by a field. And we can then ask ourselves, well, okay, let's take this domino and let's just put this domino uh, let's put the domino right here for the moment. How much field is flowing across the surface of this domino? We can imagine we got vectors. And let's go ahead and tilt the domino like this. We got vectors heading toward the magnet, making an angle with this surface. And we got vectors at every point of the surface. Vectors slightly changing their direction and always making some sort of an angle with the surface of this domino. Now, there's some variation across this domino of the strength of the field, and there's variation of the direction of the field. So let's imagine that we just take a, a smaller region of the domino, okay, say corresponding to this piece of foam here. Now, along this piece of foam, there's much less variation in the distance from the magnet and the direction from a point to the magnet. Much less variation in the magnetic field, in the, in the, in the field, and then in the direction of the field with this surface. We can imagine dividing this surface up into a large number of smaller increments. And I'm dividing them, well, that was a good line. We're, we're dividing them into small, approximately rectangular increments in this case. Uh, but, of course, we could make these increments with respect to any type of coordinate system that we choose. This is the kind of partition of this area that we might get from a rectangular coordinate system. We might get a slightly different looking partition from a cylindrical or spherical system. Uh, but we're not going to worry about those details. The whole point is that if I'm holding the magnet here, over each of these tiny intervals, there is very little variation in the magnitude or direction of the field. So if we could figure out the flow across each of these tiny increments, then we could figure out the flow of the field across this entire surface or across any other region of space, uh, subdividing in a similar manner. Now having the, used the word flow in connection with the magnetic field, which doesn't actually flow, we're using the flow analogy. Uh, we could also imagine there's some set of uh, pipes or something here that causes fluid to flow inward in a configuration similar to the one we see here. The point we're trying to make, though, is something like this. If we have a region of uh, a small uh, say rectangular region, uh, it doesn't have to be rectangular, uh, but a region of space corresponding to, let's just say, uh, our typical type of region where we have uh, some boundary here. And we take this area increment. So we have 
a surface area increment here. As we've seen, we can figure out the surface area here as a function of the surface area down here. Um, we can find a normal vector. Okay, so let's say we have a normal vector. If we have our vector field, whatever that field is, and let's just say maybe it's a field toward the origin, so maybe we have a, a vector field that looks like this. Now, if F, our vector field, is perpendicular to our surface increment, so if F is perpendicular to the surface, we'll say that flow is simply F times delta S. So it would be like the magnitude of F times, now delta S, I used a small s, and times the magnitude of delta S, where delta S is your surface area of our increment. that is we just multiply how strong the field is by how much area. So we could say that's just uh, strength of the field multiplied by area. And let's make that a asterisk multiplication symbol so we don't confuse it with a cross product. Now if F isn't parallel to delta S, well, if F was perpendicular to the surface, um, rather, if F was parallel to the surface, then then there's no flow through the surface. In other words, if I've got my small surface increment down here where the flow is parallel to the surface, then none gets through the surface. In order to have a flow through the surface, you know, let me get that stuff out of my hands so we can see. Again, if it's if it's here where the surface is parallel to the field, there's no flow across the surface. The surface has to at least be, to some extent, perpendicular to the field, has to have some component perpendicular to the field, or rather, the field has to have a component perpendicular to the surface. Now, in general, uh, the field won't be perpendicular to the surface, it won't be parallel to the surface. It'll be something in between. So we ask the question, what if F is somewhere between perpendicular and parallel to S? The word two is redundant here. This means parallel to, this means perpendicular to. But not everybody understands that. So I uh, have to abuse the language just a little bit to make the meaning as clear as possible. Now, if that's the case, and let me move the magnet out of the way now. Move this too. In that case, we consider the angle between our forgotten normal vector and our vector field. 
Now, if 